In this video tutorial, I am going to discuss about the Warburg effect. So, let us first understand that what is Warburg effect. In the year 1928, there was one scientist, his name was Otto Warburg. Otto Warburg. Now, this scientist, he had observed some interesting characteristics in the cancer cell. So, in the cancer cell, he had observed that there is a very high rate of glycolysis. And this glycolysis was somewhat unusual in that, that that glucose gets converted into the lactate, right. Now, we know that there are two types of glycolysis, right. One is aerobic glycolysis and another is anaerobic glycolysis. In aerobic glycolysis, which occurs in the presence of oxygen and here glucose gets converted to the pyruvate. Whereas, in case of anaerobic glycolysis, which occurs in the absence of oxygen and here glucose gets converted to the lactate. So, this Warburg had observed that in the cancer tissue, this glycolysis occurs, it converts glucose into the lactate. Now, whenever oxygen is not available, it is normal that glucose gets converted to the lactate. But he observed that if this cancer cells, if they are given enough amount of oxygen, then also glucose gets converted into the lactate. So, this was surprisingly that glucose is getting converted to the lactate even in presence of oxygen, right. So, this surprising phenomena that increased glycolysis and glucose getting converted to the lactate even in the presence of oxygen, we call it as a Warburg effect, right. Now, here one thing that I want to make clear is that I am not saying that in the cancer there will be a enough oxygen will be available. I am not saying that. Actually speaking, most of the time in the cancer cell there is a hypoxia, there is a less oxygen supply. But what I mean to say over here is that if this cancer cells they are isolated and then given enough oxygen, then also glucose gets converted to the lactate. Right. So, now we understand what is Warburg effect. Now, this is surprising that this metabolic changes is occurring, which is normally not observed in the normal cells. Right. We can say that this metabolic reprogramming, this metabolic reprogramming is occurring inside the cancer cell. So, next question is that, that why cancer cell needs such metabolic reprogramming? Let us try to find out. See, to understand this metabolic reprogramming, first consider that this normal cells, right? We have normal cell. Whenever these normal cells require energy, what they will do? They utilize glucose from the carbohydrate, they utilize fatty acid from the lipids or they utilize amino acid from the protein. And these simple foodstuffs undergo complete oxidation to give rise to carbon dioxide and water. And along with this complete oxidation, ATPs are also generated, right. So, this way normal cells generate ATP. But in case of cancer cells, we know that cancer is an abnormal, excessive, uncontrolled cell growth, right. So, there is a rapid division of the cell which leads to abnormal, excessive, uncontrolled cell growth, right. So, there is a this bigger cell mass is there. Now, this cancer cell, they requires proper nutrition, right. So, for that nutrient, blood vessel will also grow, we call it as a angiogenesis. But here what happens, this growth of the cell is far greater than this growth of blood vessel. So, what happens, most of the cell inside this cancer tumor, they will feel hypoxia or you can say there is a less oxygen supply. Now, what will happen whenever there is a less oxygen? See, whenever less oxygen is there, amino acid cannot undergo oxidation, so cannot provide ATP. Fatty acid cannot undergo oxidation, so fatty acid can also not provide ATP. Under a less oxygen tension, only glucose is the molecule which can provide ATP to the cell. So, in this case, in this cancer, as there is a less oxygen, glucose is the only foodstuff or only molecule which can provide ATP and this glucose gets converted to the lactate. And remember, in the normal tissue, glucose is getting completely oxidized, right. And when glucose undergo complete oxidation, it can give 32 ATPs. Whereas, in case of cancer cell, because of the less oxygen supply, 
glucose cannot be completely oxidized rather glucose is getting converted to the lactate only and lactate is the metabolic dead end it cannot be further metabolized and by this anaerobic glycolysis only two atps are produced this is very less efficient as compared to this complete oxidation of glucose right so see here one glucose can give 32 atps whereas inside the cancer cell one glucose can give rise to only two atps so to compensate for this less efficient phenomena cancer cell has to increase their rate of glycolysis right so by increasing the rate of glycolysis it can produce more atp why because more and more glucose will be get converted to the lactate whereas in case of normal tissue only a few glucose will go under complete oxidation and it will give you enough of the atp now because of the increase of glycolysis one thing will occur that is that more and more glycolysis that means more and more lactic acid is produced right so more lactic acid is produced as lactic acid itself is an acid so what will happen it will bring down ph it will create acidic environment and this acidic environment is beneficial for this cancer cell how beneficial see because of the decreased ph it increases the tumor invasion right it increases the cancer tumor invasion it also decreases the immune response against this cancer cell so decrease immune response right so because of the decreased ph these two benefits are there to this cancer tissue one more thing about this increased rate of glycolysis is that that whenever glycolysis is increased it is obvious that their all intermediates will get increased so this increased intermediates of glycolysis they provide raw material for synthesis of cellular component in this rapidly dividing tumor cell just to give you one example that glucose 6 phosphate is one of the important intermediate of the glycolysis so as glycolysis is increased there will be increased concentration of the glucose 6 phosphate and so this increased glucose 6 phosphate undergo hmp pathway that is hexose monophosphate pathway one of the product of this HMP pathway is ribose 5 phosphate and this ribose 5 phosphate is utilized for the synthesis of nucleotide and we know that these cells these cancer cells they are rapidly dividing cell right so they will of course they will uh, need a replication transcription and for that increase DNA requirement increase RNA requirement and this DNA and RNA they are synthesized from the nucleotide so see this intermediate of the glycolysis is actually providing building blocks which is required for this various component of this cancer cells so here we can see that there this because of this metabolic changes this cancer cells this cancer cells they are getting so much benefit or in other words i can say that this glycolysis this increased glycolysis is, is it is actually a growth promoting for this cancer cell right now we need to understand that what exactly biochemical steps occur which leads to this metabolic reprogramming. So next we will see that what are the biochemical steps or how this metabolic reprogramming occur. So the root cause of all this metabolic reprogramming is the over expression of this HIF1. Here this HIF1 protein is getting over expressed and here HIF1 it stands for hypoxia inducible hypoxia inducible transcription factor transcription factor 1 so there is a over expression of hif1 in most of the cancer cell this hif1 as it is a transcription factor it increases the transcription of many different gene but for our interest it increases the transcription of this glut 1 and 3 what is this glut it is the glucose transporter so there is an increased transcription of this glucose glut 1 and 3 it will lead to increased glucose entry inside the cancer cells right it also increases the transcription of enzymes of glycolysis right so by this what will happen there will be increased rate of glycolysis and if you combine these two effect what will happen there is a more and more glucose entering inside the cancer cell and more and more glycolysis is occurring so based on combination of these two event we can say that now cancer cells are glucose hungry they become glucose hungry 
Why? Because more and more glucose is entering inside the cell as well as more and more glucose is undergoing glycolysis, right? The second important thing is that it also increases the transcription of VEGF and here VEGF it stands for vascular endothelial growth factor, right? So, as the name suggests, it's a growth factor for the vascular endothelium. That means it increases the blood vessel. So, in the cancer tumor, this blood vessels growth, it is because of this VEGF, that is vascular endothelial growth factor, okay. So, it promotes angiogenesis. And the third and very important thing is that this HIF1, it also inhibits P53. Now, normally P53 is required for our cell. It has so many different important roles and because of those important roles, this P53, it is also called as a guardian of the genome. But in this video, I cannot discuss all the roles of P53 that is out of the scope of this video. But very important, one very important role is that, that it helps in the synthesis as well as assembly of mitochondrial proteins, right? So, what happens? P53, it synthesizes as well as assembles the mitochondrial protein and we know that mitochondrial proteins, they are important for the electron transport chain. Now, what this HIF1 is doing? It is inhibiting this P53. So, of course, ETC will be defective or not working. Now, this phenomena explains why even in the presence of this oxygen, glucose is getting converted to the lactate. See, for the complete oxidation of the glucose, electron transport chain is required. If electron transport chain is not there, there will no any complete oxidation of the glucose, right? So, what will happen? Glucose will get converted to the lactate, even if you supply oxygen. Now, the last remaining question is that, that is there any practical applicability of this Warburg effect? Is there any significance of this Warburg effect in the cancer treatment or any other thing? So, answer is yes it is two significance. So, let us now we will discuss about the significance. So, there are two major significance. One is therapeutic significance and other one is the diagnostic significance. So, let us look at them one by one. First, we will look at the therapeutic significance. Till now, we had seen that there is an increased rate of glycolysis in the cancer cell and this increased glycolysis is the beneficial to the cancer cells, right? So, we can develop a strategy that if we specifically inhibit glycolysis inside the cancer cell, then we can have a hope for the treatment of cancer, right? So, accordingly, certain glycolytic inhibitors are developed which can inhibit the glycolysis. So, just to give you some example, this compound, one compound is 2-deoxyglucose, then we have ionidamine, then we have 3-bromopyruvate. These all three compounds, they inhibit hexokinase enzyme and so hexokinase is the first enzyme of the glycolysis, so glycolysis will get inhibited, right? But the sad thing is that this three drugs are still under the development phase. They are not currently approved for the treatment of cancer. But luckily, we have one drug that is imatinib. Imatinib, this drug is approved for the treatment of some of the cancer and this drug acts by inhibiting hexokinase gene. It inhibits the transcription of hexokinase gene, so hexokinase will not able to get synthesized. Okay. So, again this also falls under glycolytic inhibitor. This drug is approved by the FDA for the treatment of cancer. Now, let us look at the diagnostic significance. Nowadays, there is an, one newer technique is available for the diagnosis of cancer and that is the PET scan. Now, here the PET, it stands for positron emission tomography, positron emission tomography. In this PET scan, what is done that one compound is used, its name is FDG. Here FDG stands for fluorodeoxyglucose, right? Now, here this fluoro is not a natural fluoride, but rather it is a radioactive F18. And this F18, it emits positron rays. 
and the second characteristic of this fdg is that it resembles glucose it is a structural analog of glucose so now what happens our cell or cancer cell they cannot differentiate between glucose and fdg for them glucose and fdg both are same so what happens this if glucose enters inside the cell what happen glucose get completely oxidized to carbon dioxide and water so it is completely metabolized but when fdg enters inside the cell what happens fdg converted to fdg6 phosphate now fdg6 phosphate it cannot be further metabolized so this fdg it will remain trapped inside the cell now we know that cancer cells are the glucose hungry so once fdg is given then this cancer cell will take up so much of the fdg inside the cell and so more and more fdg6 phosphate will get accumulated it gets accumulated where in the tissue which is glucose hungry so of course cancer cells are glucose hungry but some of our normal cells are also glucose hungry for example bone marrow normal bone marrow cells they are glucose hungry why because bone marrow cells these are the rapidly dividing cell and they will need a glucose for that so more and more glucose is taken up by the bone marrow so even normal person also if you give fdg their bone marrow will concentrate this fdg brain is also a normal tissue which can concentrate fdg this thing we have to keep in mind right so why brain concentrate fdg because for the brain or for the neuron cells glucose is exclusively utilized for the energy production so apart from this tissue no any other cells can concentrate fdg in much concentration and yes if abnormally cancer tumor is present in some person then this cancer cell will accumulate this fdg so here what is done fdg is injected into the person suspected of this cancer then after some time their full body is scanned for the emission of positron rays so now if positron emission is detected from some tissue then we can diagnose that yes this person might have a cancer and we can simultaneously we can also tell its exact location right so in this diagnosis of the cancer pet scan is very very useful but we have to keep in mind that in some tissue like bone marrow brain they can also accumulate fdg and can give a positive for the positron rays but if this thing is mind then we can like rule out that this tissues are normal so there is less possibility of cancer over here right so that's all for the warburg effect if you have any query or confusion please write it down in the comment section below thank you